We're going to look at Genesis chapter 10 as well as Genesis chapter 11. Now, as you might recall, Noah has three sons which all racial groups come from, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now remember, Ham is the one who messed up in sin. So because of that, it was the same thing like how God judged Adam and Eve. And whether people call that discrimination or not, the point is, is that when God casts his judgment on an individual and the group that the individual is representing, you got to stick to how God does things. Rather than saying if somebody gets judged by God that, oh, that's automatic discrimination. No, if every individual in our church whine that way, when they are going through some judgment by God and whine, oh, uh, you're discriminating against me, preacher, when you preach about that. Hey, man, when you do that, then you can justify any sin out there and erase consequences that follow. These consequences are crucial to know. That way people can learn a lesson from that. And not only that, how God plans and set up things is always done for your betterment. You also have to understand that too. So we've seen how God judged Adam and Eve. And then right here, what God did is that he judged Ham. So through this line, as we might know, we already uh, covered this. Through this account from Ham's line, we see how giants are going to return. So that's a strange thing. The strange thing is that the giants show up again when they were supposed to be drowned out by the flood of Noah. So throughout Noah's flood, what should have happened was that these giants were drowned out. But they pop up again. Now, when God cursed Ham, God specifically cursed his son Canaan. Now some people, which is a common argument, will say that only Canaan's line is cursed and not Ham's line in totality. But that one I disagree with because if you look at Genesis, I told you to look at chapter 10 and 11, but let's go back to the past a little bit more to establish the critic side of the argument. If we look at Genesis chapter 9, the reason why God didn't curse Ham is because he already blessed Ham at verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his what? Sons. So because Ham is blessed, see, he cannot get the curse. That's the reason why. Now, when you go to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18, it's very interesting what God says. God, the Holy Spirit, specifically wrote this. He specifically connected Ham with Canaan. He mentions that like twice or three times and then mentions the curse upon Canaan. So it shows right here that there is a, when Canaan is cursed, it's connected to Ham's seed. Ham is a representative for Canaan's line. So what I believe is this, is that I believe that Ham's seed in totality was cursed. Why? Because it's connected with Canaan. That's the reason why. Otherwise, why would the Holy Spirit repeat that three times? So it says right here, Verse 18, the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now notice it says the sons of Noah. See? It doesn't say the specific grandsons of Noah. It's limited to his specific grandsons. No, the sons. So it mentions Ham in totality, right? But Ham in totality, notice the latter part, and Ham is the father of Canaan. And then it mentions after that, these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Why would it say that? See, why would it include Canaan with Ham? Couldn't it just simply say Shem, Ham, and Japheth that overspread the whole earth? Notice it says in verse 22 that the sin and Ham, the what? Father, father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Now when Ham committed this sin... Notice that Canaan is included in here. Yeah. See that? So I, can't, I don't see this as limited to only Canaan. I think that it's representing Ham as a whole. Because the Lord puts Ham and Canaan together so many times all over. Um, you'll also notice right here that at verse 25, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Now, 
Another thing to understand is this, is that concerning about right here where it says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. We got to realize this. The brethren is not just referring to Canaan's brothers. If it's Canaan's brothers, then what is that? That's limited to only Ham's line. Yeah. That don't make sense. Obviously, the Canaanites were submitted to who? They were submitted under Shem's line, the Jews, actually. When the Jews conquered the land of Canaan, they got the Canaanites as their slaves. Not only that, um, Japheth was probably infamous throughout history where all the left-wing liberals throw a fit about white colonization and enslavery. So that's pretty obvious itself. But not only that, I think history itself is evidence that Ham's seed went through the curse of slavery. So there was no doubt that if we look at a historical standpoint and then we look at verse 25 and the Holy Spirit's specific mentions at Genesis 9, that it would be Ham as a totality. That would make a lot more sense. But another thing is this. Another thing is that when you look at uh, Ham seed throughout the Bible at Genesis chapter 10 with all these different nations, there's no doubt that some of these nations went under slavery as well. Uh, another thing is this. Another thing what is kind of interesting concerning about God's way of cursing people is that sometimes you got to understand this, is that when God is cursing uh, one of your descendants, it would be a representative as a whole of the community. So, for example, when God cursed Adam, it would be representing his whole of the community as well. All of mankind suffered because of one man's sin, but because of Jesus Christ, that one seed, all became alive. Sometimes one person in a community can affect the whole community. And actually, that is a Asian mentality and a Semite thing, actually. And your Bible is a Semite book. So it is a mentality that when one, an individual messes up, it can affect the whole community. So you got to understand that fact. And we see that all over throughout the Bible, too. When some child messes up in the family, it affects the whole family. And not only that, that's just common sense in our day and age, too. Is that if there's somebody who messes up in our country, then the whole country takes the blame. That happens. So that's why sometimes ambassadors, they'll have to apologize to different nations if one of their residents caused harm to their country. So that's why you got to understand about this. All right, now let's look at uh, understanding this mentality. Let's look at Genesis chapter 10. All right, Genesis 10 is a chapter, the chapter, the chapter for the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth that you want to know. It is extremely interesting. Perhaps your pastor will refer to Genesis 10 as we go throughout history. I notice that if I'm going to trace the roots of different nations, Genesis 10 is the key. So we might return to that sometime. I'm going to give you some interesting notes about some, int some nations that popped out of Genesis 10 as we go through our world history. But we're going to cover the most popular ones. Now, what's very interesting is this, is that when you read Genesis chapter 10, and when you look at history, the main superpowers during this ancient timeline was not Shem's line. Neither it was Japheth, it was actually Ham. Ham was the one that's supposed to receive the curse, but actually it was the nations that became the most prosperous. You might say, why is there that contradiction? Well, if it's not of God then, where the power and blessing comes from, where, could it, where else could it come from? So here's the thing, is that I mentioned before that giants are mentioned from Ham's line. How can that be possible unless Satan did something again right here? Unless Satan and the fallen angels did something right here? Now, there are a few theories. One of the theories which your pastor indicated, so I'll specify it now, but your pastor indicated in the last one, which last discipleship, which I'm going to specify now, is that when Ham's sexual sin, it involves something with Satan. Ham's sexual sin with Noah. The reason why is, if you look at Eve's account with the serpent, it's not something where it's plain, where it's a 
hu like a normal human sexual interaction. How the Bible did it is some kind of supernatural, spiritual strange thing where it connects with partaking the fruit from the Garden of Eden. And then your pastor uh, mentioned some indications of that at Genesis chapter 3. He didn't specify everything. But it is interesting that ham sexual sin, we know that from Habakkuk, right? Habakkuk mentioned about where it has to do with drunkenness and taking the fruit, the grapefruit of the wine, where it, can, uh, where it has to do with something sexual. Well, wait a minute. Your pastor taught you this last time. What fruit did most likely Eve ate at the Garden of Eden was grapes. Amen. Grapes. So there might be a connection here. So that's something very interesting. If you listen to your homework assignment at Dr. Upman's Adler commentary, uh, it kind of go, it kind of went like this: where when Ham was drinking and uh, he got a little drunk, and then the old friend of the family suddenly just slipped inside the room, and and then he says, "I'm just an old friend of the family," and then he says, "You know, you ever wonder about those giants and those strong heroes before the flood, Ham? Yeah, how did they get that?" Ham says, and then Satan says, "Well, I'll tell you." And Dr. Upman says, so and so. And then Dr. Upman put like just a uh, Dr. Upman put it like an abstract thing. He says, all you saw was a naked body and a, a uh, an empty bottle on the floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we don't know. So that's why this is theoretical over here. But there are some interesting indications. The second thing is this. The second thing, I think a lot of people go more for number two because number one it does seem a little controversial but if you're very open-minded with the bible there's no doubt there's some connections with sex and grape there's no doubt about that i'm not saying that it did happen with ham and noah but i do know the connection is strong with sex and drunkenness and grape and that when you apply that strong connection with eve and noah it might give you some food for thought Amen. okay Number two, which is the more likely one that people would go for, is that the sons of God survived or returned. So in other words, they came down again. Or there's a group that may have survived Noah's flood. You might say, how so? Well, how so is this, is that all these demoniacs, where do they come from? If you look at Revelation chapter 9, they come from below. So then when this flood came to the scene, these sons of God, they can stoop down to their hiding places underground. And through underground, they can avoid it. There are some uh, pagan uh, sources, as well as apocryphal sources, like the book of Enoch, that mention that the sons of God, what they did is that they built these underground things where they went beneath the earth, and then that's how they survived or escaped Noah's flood. What could also be possible is that they may have built their UFOs and then flew out of there and went to outer space. That could also be possible too. But anyways, these are simply just uh, theories and then mythological pagan apocryphal sources. And obviously you can't depend upon those things as your final authority. It's all the word of God. But your pastor, he's trying to show everything from history, including myths, what they think, okay? So I'm just pouring out everything there. Now, because this thing happened and it's connected with Ham's line, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 2. And then we're going to look at verse 20. Notice that these come from Ham's line. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, and then we'll read verse 20. The Bible says, That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt there in an old time. And the who? Ammonites called them Zamzumims, a people great and many, and tall as the who? Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horms from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. He, uh, 
and the Avims which dwelt in Hazarim, even unto Azza, the Kaftorims which came forth out of Kaftor, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. So it's giving you some little bit of interesting historical information about how these giants in different nations fought each other and survived. But notice right here that it is connected to the Anakims, Ammonites, uh, let's, and let's look back at Genesis. Let's look back at Genesis. So these are giants from the land of Canaan. And notice that as it talks about the giants in the land of Canaan, that remember who is the father of Canaan at uh, Genesis 9 and 10? It's Ham. So these giants have survived through that time. All right. Uh, we can also look at a few other interesting notes over here concerning about the sons of Ham. Let's look at Genesis chapter 10. And we see over here the, the generations of Japheth at Genesis chapter 10, verses 2 through 5. So that's something that you want to mark down, especially if you're Caucasian or you're white. If you want to know your history, that's your history. Four small verses. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, the ones that have the mo most emphasis are Ham and Shem throughout the Bible. Japheth hardly. You might say, why is that? So, look, don't scream discrimination again. Whenever God does things differently, you notice how people call it discrimination? No, it's just God doing things differently, judging different people. Amen. But people get culturally sensitive and call it discrimination. Amen. Look, God called me to preach, not you, so don't whine and scream discrimination. Why didn't God call me? All right? Trust me, you probably wouldn't want the position God put me in. And you, don't, you wouldn't want the position that God put these other people in. So sometimes you got to use your head. Okay, but anyways, why is it Shem and Ham mostly? So here might be some interesting food for thought that you might want to know. Shem and Ham are mostly mentioned throughout the Old Testament because it is a conflict of where God's people are mentioned and then a lot of the enemies that the Jews went through, Jews came from Shem. A lot of what the Jews went through were from Ham's line. And that is going to be intensely interesting even after the flood. During that time, there is a conflict with Shem's descendants and Ham's descendants, actually. It seemed like that the good guys, so to speak, or the godly line, so to speak, were from Shem's line. And they had a conflict and warfare with Ham's line. But also a lot of the interesting nations that came up during the ancient time periods, it was a mingling of Shem and Ham. You see that with Egypt, and you see that with Assyria. So that is intensely interesting. Whereas Japheth, I guess, was out there conquering the world somewhere, you know, all the way out there, <laughs> climbing mountains. But here's the interesting part. The New Testament, what's more so mentioned is Shem and Japheth. What's going on, actually, is that what you'll notice is that it was originally Shem, but it was switching to Japheth. Hence, they confused Christian culture with a white mentality. You might say, why is that? Because Japheth hardly received attention throughout these millennia. They were the dogs, the Gentiles, in the Jewish eyes, actually. So then the Lord, what did he do? He went down for the low people. Amen. And then he says, well, you know, I'll use these bunch. And boy, the Jews hated that. They really hated that because they were prized for millennia. But then the Lord switched to Japheth's line. And what happened? Japheth was the one that accepted the religion of Christianity that time. And that's why Christianity was more favored toward the Japheth's line. So what did Satan do? Then he concentrated Japheth's line. And then now today, Japheth is so messed up that you cannot tell. Amen. All right, but anyways, um, what is interesting is that Ham's line, which was originally cursed, that would be probably the number one seat today that you'd find a Christianity yeah. favored upon. Amen. So you notice right here, now don't scream out discrimination again, okay? It's just how God does things with different people, and different people respond differently. All right? You can't make it all equalized, okay? If you make it all equalized, as Dr. Upman said before, then you're mentally insane. To pretend that everybody's the same is just mental insanity. Okay, now, Genesis chapter 10, 
And then verse 6, here we go. So Shem's line is mentioned at verse 21 through 32. And then uh, Ham's line is mentioned at verses 6 through 20. Now Shem's line has an interesting deviation that I'm going to mention before we covered Ham, because Ham is going to be the most interesting. Shem, we already know what happened, all right? They went somewhere up there at the Caucasus region, somewhere. But Shem, there's something interesting. You'll notice that even though this is the race that God concentrated on, let's be honest, you hardly hear, uh, I think, that the Orientals and the Asiatic, so to speak, the East Asian country, that is more least mentioned than Japheth's line. China, North Korea, uh, South Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, etc., least mentioned out of uh, all the other racial groups in the Bible. The only time that you'll see it uh, mentioned, that you can find the closest reference, will be the book of Revelation 16 and probably chapter 9, actually. So that's the closest that you can get. But Shem's line, there were the Jews because they came from Peleg. Over here, there's a split. That's where we Orientals came from. All right, now, let's look at Genesis chapter 10. Look at verse... 21, unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. Okay, now look at the line of Shem, okay? Verse 25, and unto Eber, remember Eber is Shem's uh, son, right, at verse 21? All right, Eber were born two sons, the name of one was what? Peleg. Peleg. Okay, now, Peleg or Peleg, if you compare with... Uh, Matthew, not Matthew, if you compare with the book of Luke, where it talks about Jesus' genealogy, and you look at the book of First Chronicles, Jews came from Peleg. That's what you're going to notice right there. But there's a split. Notice over here, the name of the one was Peleg. It mentioned two sons from Shem, Shem's line. Peleg, Jews, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was that's where you guys come from. So if any of you are Orientals, that's where we come from, Joktan. So your pastor wrote his doctorate paper on that, and it is intensely fascinating. I'm not going to go through every single detail on that one. But um, notice right here that as we keep reading over here, verse 26, and Joktan begat Almodad, and then it lists all these different names, right? Ver, the last part of verse 29, all these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Misha, as thou goest unto see far a what? East. They were going east. See, there is no doubt that Orientals came from Joktan's line. You might say, why? Because they were heading toward east. Peleg was more west of that. Joktan's descendants, they were going further east. But what's also interesting is that if you go to a mount of the east, if any of you like to use some Greek and Hebrew criticisms, here's something that you can stuff in your mouth, actually, you Greek and Hebrew scholars. Actually, Hebrew, a mount of the east, if you translate it more literally, it's a mount of the orient. Ah, interesting. interesting, right? Interesting. Okay, anyway, so that's where the orientals came from. But we're hardly mentioned. So I'm, I guess I'm going to be culturally sensitive and cry on camera because the only time I, men I mentioned is actually right over here at Ver Genesis 10.30 and Revelation 16 and 9 where the Antichrist takes over my countries. <laughs> okay, so calm down, all right? See, people get all culturally sensitive. It's just sickening. Okay. All right, anyways, now let's go to Ham. This is where all the ancient superpowers come from. Verse 6, And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and Phut and Canaan. Ooh, okay, look at that. And the sons of Cush, Sheba and Havilah, Sapta, Rama, Sapteca, and the sons of Rama, Sheba and Dedan. Verse 8, here is key. This guy is very important in your ancient history that the Holy Spirit, he did make mention of this person. Now you'll notice that 
the Genesis account during those millennia, it didn't mention too much detail. The details start building up. Listen up now. You notice how God the Holy Spirit writes? The details build up when he starts with Abraham and his descendants. That's, right. yeah. That's where specifics come out with every line. But why didn't he do it prior to Abraham? Because prior to Abraham, God's people were very small. It was only Noah. It was only Enoch, Adam and Eve, and Abel. Mankind was fully corrupted by Satan's contamination. So because of Satan's con contamination and kingdom, the Holy Spirit saw it not fit to make too much mention of it. Why? Don't give too much credit to the devil's history. God wants you to know his people, his history, the history of his people. So that's food for thought. But even with the devil's people, the Lord knows that this guy is a significant figure, so he, so he at least mentioned two or a few verses. That's it. Out of all of Ham's children, it is, meant, it is interesting, the Lord made specific mention of Nimrod. Verse 8, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So notice that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, some people might think that isn't that a positive thing. No, that's a negative thing. Notice this is mighty hunter before the Lord. That's basically when he was living his life as a hunter before God, that was abomination. Let's look at that kind of logic with the book of Genesis and look at Genesis chapter 13. That's a good number, ain't it? Genesis 13, a great number. And look at verse 13. That's another great number. Chapter 13, verse 13. All right, church, uh, you've learned this. Uh, the number 13 represents rebellion. Yeah, that's right. Look at verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners, what? Before the Before Lord, the Lord wow. exceedingly. See, so that's something important to understand. So when we look back at Genesis 10, 9, before God, what? He was a mighty hunter. Hunter, if you look up that, another key phrase is look up the word hunt throughout your Bible. It's not positive. It's mostly negative. Even when the Lord does hunting himself, it's used as a negative term, mostly throughout your Bible. So notice right here that a hunter is something negative. Now a hunter during that timeline, how would they hunt during that timeline? They didn't have a crossbow or a gun. How would they hunt during that timeline? Like this. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, your pastor mentioned to you, this first horseman comes out, and he comes forth conquering and to conquer, like a hunter. And if we believe that that's the Antichrist, and we believe that's the Pope, what kind of fingers does the Pope raise up occasionally? Like this, just like the hunter does with what? All right. Think about that for a while. Think about everything that has to do with this. It's not really love and peace like you would say. Smoking cigarettes, right? Like that? This is not uh, Winston Churchill. I know he did his famous V for victory, but actually you'll notice that to attain that peace was through much death through World War II. It means ultimate surrender from the opposing side. And that's the Antichrist proclaiming peace like this through what? Bloodshed, conquering and to conquer. All right. Anyways, back to our main text here. Nimrod, notice right here, verse 10, and the beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, you want to know this one. So Nimrod came from Ham's line. Nimrod's first kingdom was Babel. Wait a minute. Look at Genesis 11. We're not going to read that. Isn't that the famous Tower of Babel? Why was Nimrod a mighty hunter before the Lord? Because at Genesis 11, look what they were trying to do before God. Verse 4, they, uh, Genesis 11, 4, they said, Go to, let us build us a city and tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, did you read that carefully? They did not want to spread out throughout the whole world. 
Remember, God says at Genesis 9, what? Spread throughout the whole earth. They disobeyed. They did not want that. So they said, let's make a tower that would reach all the way to heaven before we scatter abroad. Let's build us a kingdom all the way up to heaven. You see how that's like trying to desecrate God? Like, hey, we can reach all the way to heaven. What did the Bible say? The Bible says even if you try to reach up to heaven, you're not going to reach up there. Lucifer, didn't he says, I will exalt myself above the heights of the cloud, the stars reach the top of heaven. That's something satanic. That's not something positive. So notice over here, that's why it makes sense he was a hunter before the Lord. It's interesting. One of these Bible, old Bible movies that I saw, it gave a very interesting scene where Nimrod, he was climbing on top of the Tower of Babel. And what he did was that he took that bow and arrow, just like a hunter, and then he aimed it like toward God and then shot it up at God up to heaven, which was pretty interesting. And then the scenery made it more dramatic where after Nimrod, as soon as he shot that arrow up to heaven, all of a sudden his followers start to speak in Chinese, Vietnamese, and Spanish, and then all the other world languages. And then Nimrod's kingdom just fell apart after that. It's like God's trying to rub dirt at Nimrod's face. So we know that's what happened at the Tower of Babel at verses 6 through 9. From verses 6 through 9, notice that God destroyed the work at the Tower of Babel. But look, look at the wording, okay? Look at this careful wording. This is repeating Genesis 6. This is repeating Lucifer before Adam. Look at verse 6, Genesis 11, 6. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. Now this they begin to do. Look at the wording here. Remember Genesis 6. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have what? Imagined to do. Remember Genesis 6? Their imagination just kept going wild and wicked, and God says nothing can stop them from that. Remember Rom uh, Romans 1 says, today's modern age is what? Imagination. Dark imagination. That's our society. And your pastor showed compared the modern civilization, today's civilization, with Genesis 6 civilization, not much different, right? Unique, they like to mask it with words though. Uniqueness, creativity, independence, critical thinking. That's what they brainwash you in schools. So that what? Your imagination can run wild. And then whatever weird concocted belief you come out out there, then society can tolerate that. And if you do not tolerate that, then you are hate group. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. Okay, so let's talk about some interesting things of Nimrod. There's a book that I would recommend, but you have to be careful as well. So it is Alexander Hislop's book. Alexander Hislop. Now, I cannot, I was going to read portions, but then I realized, look, if I read portions, then uh, we're not going to get through the day because I have to read full pages to show you context. So I cannot do that. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to give you a summary from the top of my head. And then you can compare that with his book. There is one other book that I'd highly recommend. And this is in comic book format. So this is even more fun. The guy is such a genius. So um, it's called Babylon Religion. And it's in Jack Chick comic style. He's old-fashioned cartoon drawing, not like the Crusader comics, okay? It's actually Jack Chick old cartoon, and it is by David W. Daniels. And what he does is that his book is more reliable in documentation than uh, his law, believe it or not. So David, uh, Dr. Upman actually recommended this book at his bulletin. So um, this one, if you're, if you're bored reading Hislop's book, then you can read David Daniels. But to be quite honest with Hislop, uh, what he wrote was actually true because all you have to do is compare with ancient accounts. And then the bottom line is this. There is no doubt that all world religions originated from Semiramis and Nimrod. Yeah. That's the bottom line of the whole thing. So some of these um, amateurish Calvinists who like to criticize Bible believers and Hislop, and says, oh, his love's words has been refuted, so says Judas White, blah, 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 and his Omega and Alpha ministries. I just did it backwards, but anyway. So the point, so these idiots, 
they, what they like to do is that they like to point out certain portions of Hislop's works where he was misquoting or it was not following full context. But, you know, that's the same thing they did with Gail Ripplinger. The point is this, yeah. Ripplinger and Hislop, they took too many works. Yeah. And it's a lot of hard work, okay? So when you read Hislop's stuff, he was reading like really deep historical accounts that, that you wouldn't dig up online and also from really uh, high-class scholars. So this was like really deep stuff. So looking through all that with lots of footnotes and digging through all that thousands of stuff, obviously, you're going to find something to slip up on. Yeah. Your pastor did 2,000 plus videos. And look, I'm not a perfect man either. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm bound to have slipped up somewhere. So see, that's what people don't have the common sense of, okay? So all you have to do is just compare it with other ancient works. That's it. And then see what's, uh, and then find what's true and false with this book. But overall, despite of all that, the main truth is this. All world religions come from Semiramis Nimrod. So you won't escape that fact. Okay. Now, here's the bottom line. So it seems like that there was this warfare that was going on with Shem's line, Semites, and then Ham's line, the Hamites during this time. So during this time, there seemed to be like good guys and there, and there were bad guys during that time. Now, during that time, what was going on was that Ham's line was building their own civilization. Where they learned that lesson from? Like Cain did at Genesis. That's very interesting. Not only that, um, if you look at Ham's line, where Assyria, Egypt, and also Babylon would come from, they all boast about having some connection to the gods that taught them the ways. So it shows right here that Satan's forces, the, the ones who survived or returned from the flood, or whether they came from Ham's line, whatever it is, that they were the ones that continued this trace of power, of civilization, of repeating Genesis 6 influences, so to speak. So Nimrod was reviving this with his kingdom. Now notice that this was all one world kingdom. You notice that? They didn't want to be scattered. So let's all do this one world. The Antichrist, one world, new world order system, one world kingdom could have started way back at Genesis 11. God was, your God is very genius. How he divided it was different languages. You know why that was genius? Because the different languages made these nations prize their own people and culture. And for millennia, they never got along. There was always warfare, bloodshed. Now, I'm not saying that I'm condoning that. That's, all, that's very sad and that's unfortunate. But see, God knows human nature, what they're capable of in their good ways or in their bad ways. Yeah. So God will use whatever good way or bad way in your human nature to fulfill his purpose. Amen. That's the thing about your God. Your God's genius, Amen. incredibly genius. This worked, man, for, uh, for the past thousands of years of history. It caused that division until, until stupid modern century came in. You notice that? Came with good intentions, but see, that's how Satan deceives people. With good, sincere intentions and heart, that masks the demonic influence what Satan's fulfilling at the end. Okay, uh, so with this conflict going on with Hamites and Semites, uh, Cush, the, uh, the story goes that Cush married an incredibly beautiful woman. Different historical accounts will also admit to this fact as well. The, a, very, it, a very beautiful woman named Semiramis. Semiramis that time. So Semiramis, she was actually a, an incredibly beautiful woman, which is why all these goddess religions, uh, goddess names came out from Semiramis. The different gods that came out would come from Nimrod. Nimrod. Cush, Semiramis had a child named Nimrod together. Now, it could go the other way. The other way could be this. Nimrod married Semiramis instead of Cush marrying Semiramis. It could go that way. So either or, you can depend upon yourself what to do. But there's no doubt that either or, Nimrod did marry Semiramis, either or. It doesn't matter which way, actually. So Nimrod, Semiramis, they married. 
So you might say, wait, so then if Cush married Semiramis and, Nim and they had a son named Nimrod, you're saying if that account is true, then Nimrod married his mother? Yeah. Yeah, it's gross. So um, either or, there's no doubt these two had a marriage. Either or. If it's Cush that did it first or Nimrod. So Semiramis, undoubtedly, she was a beautiful woman, and she went through many marriages, which makes a lot more sense when you come to Revelation 17, how God really hated this particular woman and always said whore and harlot. Now, that's probably like one of the most worst the name callings that you would refer to a woman. That's very base, but that's how Semiramis was. And God connected Jezebel with that and all other bad women's in the Bible. It's intensely interesting because Jezebel was repeating Semiramis doings. But we'll see that later on. So notice Satan keeps reviving his things from history, right? So Jezebel will repeat Semiramis. Nimrod's kingdom trying to repeat Genesis 6. Lucifer trying to repeat his kingdom at Genesis 6 before Adam's kingdom. Before the, uh, before the six days of creation. Look at this. It's just Satan trying to keep reviving, repeating. you got to look at this historical pattern. Okay. Now, Shemites, uh, or the Semites during that time, or Shem's line, they were in constant conflict. So because Nimrod just created this horrendous amount of religion, where you see a lot of the Catholic observances, days and rituals, uh, masonry, etc., where they have these secret oaths and all that, it all came from Nimrod's religion. Nimrod's religion. All these gods and goddesses that came out, Nimrod's religion. Sacrificing children as well, human sacrifice and etc., all came from Nimrod's uh, form of religion and worship. In fact, it was so bad that according to ancient sources from what we read about the two Babylons, is that Shem got so angry that he actually killed Nimrod. And so because he killed Nimrod, and I think he also dismembered his body too probably. Just like what you read about the account, what is interesting at the book of Judges about the dismembering. But anyway, that shows how much vengeance they had, so much anger that time. So what happened was the whole kingdom was in disruption. So Semiramis during that time, she gave birth to another child after that. His name, get this now, you probably heard this name before, Tammuz. So Tammuz was either the offspring of Nimrod or Semiramis just laid around with another guy. And that's no surprise because Semiramis, you know, she had a lot of bad relations. So here's what's even worse than that. Semiramis married Tammuz. So there was no doubt she is the whore, okay? She is the whore. So when Tammuz was born, then hence came the idea of reincarnation. Before that time, they had a more ancient belief where it's called transmigration, so to speak. The idea is this, in reincarnation, she proclaimed to the world while it was in disruption due to Nimrod dying, being killed by Shem, that Tammuz is the reincarnation of Nimrod. And supposedly this is where December 25th Christmas came to the scene, so which is intensely interesting. And uh, Semiramis would point out to the sun, and when the sun rose up, she would say, there is your god, that's Nimrod. And thus the sun god would be affiliated quite often with Nimrod and Tammuz. And not only that, that's why Egypt made a big deal about the sun. And diff not just them, it's also interesting, why do different religions worship the sun? You ever thought about that? If there's a common root source somewhere, see? A common root source. And that's actually Semiramis and Nimrod. All right, so let me uh, give you a couple names throughout different countries, which I think you'll find pretty interesting. So originating from Semiramis and Nimrod, as we go throughout different countries, you could uh, read it in this way. Basically, as we go through this mother and child worship, see Semiramis and Tammuz, right? 
and you'll see idols of this all over around the world. Where do they, all these different nations get that from? See, originated from Semiramis and Nimrod. That's proof over there. So this is Babylonian worship, but you can see this throughout different countries. The Chinese has a mother goddess called Xingmu, or the Holy Mother, and she is pictured with child in her arms with rays of glory around her head. Wait a minute, that looks like the Virgin Mary, the Roman Catholic Church. That's why his lob spoke was hated by the Catholic Church. It was infamous. It was infamous because he was trying to prove Roman Catholic religion came from, uh, ancient, from Semiramis Nimrod. In fact, even Jehovah Witnesses used his lob's book to show how, um, ancient, uh, how Catholic religion came from ancient Babylon religion. That's how widespread his lob's book was. You, you can tell the Catholic Church hated his law. <laughs> Ancient Germans worshipped the virgin Hertha with child in her arms. The Scandinavians called her Disa, who was also pictured with a child. Etruscans called her Nutria. The Druids, you know those Druids who did those uh, fleshy, fleshly sacrifices, those weird stuff, blood stuff? The Druids, they did the Virgo Patatura, was worshipped as the mother of God. India, she is known as Indrani, represented with child in her arms. Mother goddess, known as what? Aphrodite or Ceres to the Greeks. Nana to the Sumerians. Venus or Fortuna to the old days of Rome. Her child, Jupiter. Asia, mother was known as Cybele. The child is Dioeus. Let's see right here. Um... It's interesting where there's another one with the mother and child as Devaki and Krishna. So there's another one of those illustrations and pictures that shows Devaki and Krishna together. Isi is another name, great goddess. Her child is Swara. Let's see over here. Ephesus, the mother goddess, was known as what? Diana. And then you can see that with uh, modern culture with Wonder Woman, so to speak. Egypt, the mother was known as Isis. Child is Horus. Let's see over here. What other examples? So you'll notice like throughout the entire world, you'll see these mentions about this mother goddess as well as the child. So I think I pretty much covered a lot of the other things here. So there are some mentions here about the Egyptian goddess of fertility as Isis. And she's standing on a crescent moon with stars surrounding her head, just like the Roman Catholic Church will do it. There's also the Phoenician goddess of fertility, Astarte. She's associated with the crescent moon as well. Isis, child Horus as well, et cetera, et cetera. So notice over here that there's already so many mentions of these mother and child. Now, what happened during this time, which is kind of interesting, so I'm going to read a page from David W. Daniel's work. So I know that I'm past the time, but I'm going to finish this one. I have to finish this one at least so it can follow in context. So uh, what is interesting in David W. Daniel's work is that he writes over here about Semiramis's beauty. And this is documented by uh, G.J. White Melville. The work is Sarkadon, A Legend of the Great Queen, page 28. So this is what this archaeologist wrote concerning about Semiramis. She was beautiful, no doubt. Her form was matchless in symmetry, so that her every gesture in the saddle or on the throne was womanly, dignified, and graceful while each dress she wore seemed that in which she looked her best. She possessed more than a man's power of mind and force of will. Now you got to remember during the ancient time, women did not have powerful roles. Even secular historians who don't know about Semiramis' connection with ancient Babylon, they do admit that there was a woman named Semiramis who existed, and she had a powerful role as a woman, even though the men looked down on her. So this was one demonic, diabolical, genius, beautiful woman. 
A shrewd observer would have detected in those bright eyes, despite their loving glance, the genius that can command an army and found an empire. In the clean-cut jaw and prominence of the beautifully molded chin, a cold recklessness that could harden on occasion to pitiless cruelty. How about that? Despite that beautiful exterior, there's a pitiless cruelty, cruelty inside. Now, you notice throughout your entire Bible, the Bible never mentioned her name. Never at all. Never. But you know what the Bible did? It did mention about a specific evil woman, and God used that woman phrase throughout the entire Bible as a symbolic reference, and it's always represented as a whore. Did you notice that? What do you think God was thinking in his mind when God wanted to picture Israel as a great sinner and use a woman as an example? He always thought of a whore. Why? Because he was thinking of Semiramis. Semiramis. Jezebel called her a harlot. Babylon called her a harlot. You know why? That's how powerful Semiramis', Semiramis influence was during that time. So this was pure evil. Tammuz, it is said that uh, Semiramis had him uh, go out on a wild boar hunt, and probably a boar killed Tammuz, actually. Why? Because Semiramis wanted to retain her power. But she's such a genius, they needed a male figure. Because why? Ancient culture would respect it more, look up to a god more if there's a male figure. Hence Nimrod was there that time. Hence Tammuz was there that time. But Semiramis, how she received her power was using these two. Was using these two. Especially Tammuz as a tool. That's where your epic of Gilgamesh would come from and all the other ancient Sumerian accounts. Now, uh, what happened after that was that God split the descendants from the Tower of Babel. Next discipleship, uh, I didn't talk about it tonight, but next discipleship, I will talk about the three ancient superpowers and also two ancient kingdoms prior to that. And that's why God decided I'm going to use a brand new group of people. And he called Abraham out of those ancient prestigious kingdoms during that time. All right? This is our world history. Look, when you look at world history, it's very interesting. It's also understandable where mankind is heading toward and why God was doing those things throughout the Bible. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. Help us to learn important lessons throughout our history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.